Um, now, we're going to do something we haven't done before, which is an interactive uh, panel session led by Jerome Goldberg, uh, Ivan Popov and John Best, uh, most of you will know as well. We're going to have a couple of the sports med physicians and surgeons on the panel, and Jerome is going to lead us through uh, the, um, the question and answer period that we're doing here. Thanks, Doron. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is something new, as Doron mentioned. What we plan to do is, time permitting, present six cases of shoulder and elbow pathology, which is more than likely to present to the physiotherapist as the uh, first up uh, manager of the condition. So you people will be seeing these patients more frequently than the GP or the orthopaedic surgeon. So just the first case, a 50-year-old female, dominant arm pain, a three-month history, pain with movement, discomfort at night, and more specifically, a progressive loss of motion. There's no history of trauma and no significant medical history. So I'm going to ask you, by a show of hands, when this patient comes to your office, by the time you've got a history, you're thinking about what diagnosis is this. So who thinks this might be impingement? If you just raise your right hand. No one? Capsulitis, adhesive capsulitis. Calcific tendonitis. Rheumatoid arthritis. Instability. Okay, so most people think, are thinking of adhesive capsulitis. Well, let's look at the case. The patient has a tender shoulder. Their range of motion is 90 degrees of active elevation. When you examine them, there's 90 degrees of passive elevation, so they can't lift their arm above 90 degrees. They have 10 degrees of external rotation, and we'll assume the other side is 90 degrees, and they can internally rotate to the sacrum. They have normal power, a positive impingement sign, and a normal neck. So again, does anyone think it could be anything other than the diagnosis of capsulitis? Is there anyone who can name another diagnosis that this could be based on what we have now? Just yell out. Rotator cuff? No, not really. They're only Exactly. So, just to get this right for you, Jerome, there are, you sorry, you have to state the lectern no. for the webinar people. There are only there are only two conditions that can lead to loss of both active and passive movement. So the patient can't lift more than 90 degrees, either actively or passively, and also has limited external rotation and internal rotation. And that's adhesive capsulitis or osteoarthritis. It really can't be anything else in the absence of a traumatic lesion such as a fracture or a dislocation. So again, just by show of hands, who would order an x-ray? You, you guys wouldn't order an x-ray? Yeah, yeah, please. Including the panel? <laughs> <laughs> Who would order an ultrasound? A few. Who would order an MRI? It's very expensive. Who would order blood tests? And who would order EMG and nerve conduction studies? Okay, if I could ask the panel, um, Ivan, what tests would you order out of all of those? 
Well, you'd want an X-ray to exclude a, a osteoarthritis, as that's the, other, that's the other part of your differential diagnosis. There's an increased risk of um, adhesive capsulitis in people with diabetes and thyroid problems. If there's any suspicion that they might have either of those, I think a blood test is totally appropriate. I think occasionally you would order an MRI scan if there's any preceding history of trauma, because sometimes pe people have a fall, can tear their rotator cuff and develop a capsulitis at the same time, and that could obscure the clinical uh, signs and symptoms which may lead to diagnosis of rotator cuff repair, uh, rotator cuff tear. But if there's no history of trauma, I, I wouldn't bother with an MRI scan. John, would you do anything different to that? Um, I wouldn't. But just as a caution, if they have an MRI early, it'll be inconclusive. Often the the findings on an MRI scan, which is normally in the axillary pouch and the anterior capsule, may not occur till a bit later. So you can really confuse the diagnosis. Thanks. So look, essentially, you've made the diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. You have to exclude osteoarthritis. And the easiest way to do that is a simple x-ray. Because this is generally thought to be a condition of post and perimenopausal women, and there is a much greater incidence in people with endocrine disease, I personally order a full blood count ESR and CRP to exclude an inflammatory condition, but I also always get a fasting blood sugar and thyroid function tests. And the reason for that is if you do have a patient who is pre-diabetic or diabetic or has thyroid disease, if those diseases are not treated, the capsulitis often runs a rather long course. So if you look at the uh, diagram above, there are three distinct phases of capsulitis. In the first phase, which lasts about nine up to 12 months, you get loss of movement and increasing pain. In the second phase, which kicks in around a year, the patients experience a reduction in the pain, but they have a permanent loss of both active and passive movement. And in the third phase, which usually uh, starts at about 18 months, range of motion returns spontaneously. All the studies have shown that if you leave the patient alone and you don't treat them with anything apart from analgesics, they get better anyway at about 18 months. And the issue with physical therapy, especially a stretching program, is that the patients often complain that you make them worse. I think it's very sensible to give them a strengthening program with TheraBand below the horizontal, keeps their strength up, but I don't see a place initially in uh, giving them a stretching program. If you look at the first phase, you will often see the patient within three or four weeks of the onset of symptoms. And they present as if they have impingement. They still haven't experienced the loss of movement, which starts to occur in the first three months. So not uncommonly, you'll see the patient once or twice, and they'll come back a third time at about eight or 10 weeks, and they'll say, look, the physio's not helping. In fact, when I do the exercises, I get worse. And further that, I've noticed a progressive loss of mo motion. So you can be fooled into thinking, if you see the patient in the early phases, that they actually have impingement rather than uh, a capsulitis. So, Let's look at all the treatment options for tendonitis. Cortisone injections, physiotherapy, anti-inflammatory medication. But the treatment for adhesive capsulitis is far different. And if I asked Paul, what uh, would you do if you see a patient initially with adhesive capsulitis? How would you counsel them? and manage them once you've made the diagnosis? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I presented this two or three years ago, and hopefully the 
um, video is still up on the Orthosports website. I know it's on my website at the moment, so if, you want to, if anyone wasn't here when I presented that, uh, please feel free to go back and have a look. Um, as with stress fractures, I love seeing patients with capsulitis because I know they're going to get better and I'm able to reassure them uh, and patients love to be reassured that they're going to get better. Um, but they can have a lot of pain and I think from a medical point of view, I've found that intra-articular cortisone injection and saline hydrodistension to be a very effective way of trying to treat that pain um, and there are very few patients that don't get some improvement and a point I made in that talk was if someone's had pain at night and they haven't slept for three months they'll be very happy to try anything and when you allow them to sleep they're very uh, grateful. Uh, so yeah, so oral anti-inflammatory medicines, physiotherapy with a strengthening but not aggressive stretching program and I go to a intra-articular cortisone injection and saline hydrodistension very early. Um, and I think the literature suggests that that shortens the overall duration of the frozen shoulder. So, Paul, um, after the hydrodilatation, and I might add Paul uh, uh, does a lot of these, and a hydrodilatation is very operator dependent. So if you're going to recommend that uh, someone have a hydrodilatation, be sure to send them to a radiologist or sports physician who are doing them quite regularly. So after your hydrodilatation, what do you advise the physiotherapist to do? Again, uh, Rochelle Buckbinder did most of the literature on this a couple of years ago, and she seemed to suggest that the addition of hydrodilatation um, and steroid injection plus physiotherapy seem to give better outcomes in terms of quicker return of range of movement. Uh, so I do suggest physio tell the patient to take the first week just to let the shoulder start to improve. Uh, again, we don't want to keep the shoulder moving too early if it's painful. Um, I start them on a basic wall slides um, and um, just some pendular exercises and then ask them to see the physiotherapy for some manual treatment and an exercise program. So I think that's important to note. Although in the initial phases, if we're treating them non-operatively or conservatively without a hydrodilatation, we don't recommend a stretching program. Once they've had the hydrodilatation, you would institute a stretching program with strengthening to try and maintain and increase range of motion. Um, John, would you have anything to add to that? Um, I do it a little bit differently in the post-injection phase. I actually hold them back from going back to their physiotherapist for two to three weeks. I let them know that at some point they will need to return to their physio for an active stretch program. What I ask the patient to do post-injection is to follow um, a self-administered stretching program. Depending on how teachable they are, I'll give them one of two options. One is drawing the alphabet um, with their injured arm at a level where they're comfortable. Um, and I'd ask them to do that for five minutes, four times a day. And the other is what Paul suggested, so forward elevation, external rotation, so assisted active stretches in that regard. Um, some people do get quite, some people can get a reaction for 48 hours, 72 hours after the distension. And I think at that stage, um, you're still going to get a corticosteroid effect for six weeks plus. So I'll see them again three weeks after the injection and then probably send them back to the physio. But I think fundamentally we're saying the same thing, it's just a timing issue there. Uh, Daron, can you uh, comment about the surgical treatment, manipulation under anaesthetic and uh, arthroscopic releases? I, I can. Just one little thing. The radiologists really like it, or the sports med guys, if you tell them to take some painkillers, strong painkillers like panadine, Ford or tramadol, about 20 minutes before the injection, because they can tolerate much more of a distension, which tends to work better. So before they go for their, uh, their hydrodilatation, just take some painkillers about 20 minutes beforehand. My experience with it, Daron, I've done hundreds of these now is the patients tolerate it very well. Um, yeah, down south people are tough, you know, we're talking yeah, eastern suburbs patients. Yeah. Tough in the shire. 
Um, in some I, parts of Sydney, at cocktail, your, your favourite sundowner an hour before seems right. to work. Um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of surgery, we try not to operate on these people, if at all possible. Um, manipulation uh, works in some people. You can fracture the humerus while you're doing it. Capsular release works really well, but you can cut their axillary nerve while you're doing it. Uh, so really for a self-limiting uh, condition, unless the person is uh, income dependent, you know, a scaffolder who can't get his arm above his head uh, to be able to uh, get back to work, uh, for me there's very, very little indication to actually do that operation. Okay, let's move on to the second case then. Um, we have a 45-year-old male, dominant arm, two weeks prior to presenting he has a significant fall onto his outstretched arm. He has significant pain with elevation, but specifically a lot of night pain. So again, the most likely diagnosis, show of hands, instability, anyone? Impingement, possibly. Cuff tear. Yeah, it's very hard based on that history though to distinguish between impingement and a cuff tear. Soft tissue injury. Yeah, not in the Shire though, they're tough, right Paul? <laughs> and a ruptured long head of biceps. Okay. Let's have a look at the uh, clinical examination. Tender shoulder, mild bruising, ruptured long head of biceps. Now he's got 90 degrees of active elevation but 160 degrees of passive elevation, different to the lady in case one. He can externally rotate to 45 degrees but internal rotation is limited to the sacrum. They have a positive impingement sign, a negative apprehension sign and significantly a loss of external rotation power. So let's look at that again. Anyone vote for instability? Anyone vote for impingement? Few. Cuff tear? Majority. Soft tissue? Injury? Still a few. And an isolated rupture of the long head of biceps? Okay. Just a couple of things. Any young person who falls over, who has bruising round the shoulder, and there is no fracture on x-ray, has a torn rotator cuff until proven otherwise. Any young person who ruptures their long head of biceps, there's statistically a 50% chance that they have ruptured their cuff as well. I'm not talking about an old guy like myself, but a young guy at 45. So again, the most sensitive index of a complete cuff tear is examining them for loss of external rotation power. So this patient has bruising, ruptured long head of biceps, loss of external rotation power, you can be pretty confident that this patient has a full thickness cuff tear at the age of 45 in their dominant arm. So who would order a plain x-ray? Yeah. Okay, why would you order a plain x-ray? Well firstly, you have to make sure they don't have arthritis. You have to exclude a tumour. They're very rare, but secondary bone tumours do occur around the shoulder. And thirdly, you can see the anatomy of the shoulder and we'll discuss that a little bit later. Who would organise an ultrasound? A few? Anyone on the panel organise an ultrasound? No. Not unless they're pregnant. <laughs> okay, I'll... That's fair. The largest paper in the world on comparing ultrasounds and MRIs was done at Prince of Wales Hospital. We had 416 patients, 
They all had ultrasounds, they all had either MR arthrograms or CT arthrograms if they couldn't have an MRI. And the accuracy rate of ultrasounds was 40% for a full thickness cuff tear. So in fact, you have more chance of tossing a coin and getting the right result than you have of doing an ultrasound. So I, would, I, I can't remember the last time I've ever ordered an ultrasound because they are just so inaccurate. Would anyone organise a CT scan? No. MRI? Or MR arthrogram? Who would order an MRI without contrast? Who would order an MR arthrogram? Okay. Much easier to read. You get a better view of the labrum and other uh, structures in the shoulder. An MRI without contrast, it's very, very difficult to tell the size of a partial tear. An MR arthrogram, you can tell the size of a partial tear. So if you look at the slide on your right, you see an MR arthrogram, it clearly shows a full thickness cuff tear. The plain X-ray on your left, you can see those lines we've drawn, and that's to measure something that is very popular at the moment called the critical shoulder angle. And studies have shown that if you draw a line from the bottom of the glenoid that uh, intersects the top of the glenoid and goes uh, vertically, and then a second line that goes from the bottom of the glenoid to the outer aspect of the acromion, if you have an angle of greater than 38 degrees, the patient is likely to have a cuff tear or get a cuff tear later on. If the angle is less than 33 degrees, then they are more likely to develop arthritis. And if it's between the two, it doesn't really matter, they'll probably develop one or the other. <laughs> the issue with that is you can see that having a lateral acromial hook predisposes the patient to uh, developing a cuff tear. So that's an interesting concept that we're just starting to learn about. I'd also like to bring to your attention um, this concept of force couples that was uh, popularised by an orthopaedic surgeon in Texas called Steve Burkhart. And if you think about the force couples in the shoulder when you see a patient with their MRI, it will help you manage that patient, especially the older ones. So if you look essentially at two force couples, one horizontal, which involves subscapularis and infraspinatus, so horizontally through the middle of the uh, glenoid and numeral head, and a vertical force couple, which involves deltoid and supraspinatus. So there are two force couples in the shoulder. If, one, if a tendon in one of the force couples is torn, but not the second force couple, then you might get away with non-operative treatment. If, however, a tendon or two tendons are torn in a horizontal and vertical force couple, then surgery is likely to be the only way to restore their function. So, to be clear, if you've torn supraspinatus and infraspinatus and subscapularis are intact, you've only injured the vertical force couple and you might get away by strengthening the horizontal force couples and avoiding surgery. But if you have a tear that involves a vertical force couple, such as supraspinatus, plus a horizontal force couple, either subscapularis and or infraspinatus, then you're unlikely to achieve a functional improvement without surgery. So, let's talk about treatment options. <coughs>
I'd ask uh, John and Paul to comment on the non-operative options, which include cortisone, PRP injections and physical therapy. And let's take this patient of 45 years of age. So it's with a full thickness cuff tear here? Full thickness yep. cuff tear of supraspinatus, as per that MRI. Um, with a full thickness cuff tear in that age group, I always would put on their radar that surgery may be required for them, uh, not to take that off their radar. So very early we would discuss that, because uh, we know that tears get bigger in patients under 60. Um, the, the mainstay of rehab really is, uh, is muscle balancing and posture. Um, by the time they would get to us, there's often secondary trapezius dysfunction, hitching, and scapular dyskinesis. So correcting that, which um, I've learned so much from physios on that. So I may start them on some basic exercises such as a wall push, uh, isometric retraction, um, self-massage through the traps, uh, so, so doing that. Within that as well, if they're impinging, you would consider a subacromial corticosteroid injection, but if they're planning to have surgery, um, that's not a great idea because there are studies to show that corticosteroid that may get in and around the rotator cuff may affect outcome. So this is for someone who really is prepared to spend two, three or four months to see how they go non-operatively. And um, I wouldn't use PRP in a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Um, I think that, uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and the final thing is load management, so helping them exercise safely, which effectively from an upper body perspective means keeping their elbows hinged and being able to do things in a straight line. So if they still want to keep going to their gym, you have to be very, very careful, but they generally can manage a seated pull, standing curls, um, tricep kick out, but you wouldn't be doing anything in the over position or overhead. Can you comment on PRP any place? Yeah, I mean, first thing I'd think this patient I'd have him off to you guys because I think he needs an operation. So, you know, and it would have to be a, he'd have to have a fairly strong case for not wanting surgery for us to go down rehabilitation pathway. Um, and I agree with John, I don't think PRP can magically take big gaps in tendons and knit them back together. So you need some construct there um, for it to heal up. So I, I wouldn't recommend PRP for him. It's not going to help. Okay, so I think it's clear that none of the panel, myself included, would recommend non-operative management in this patient for many, many reasons. But I'll ask Ivan, the patient comes to see you, how soon should the surgery be done and what are the problems in letting it go, say, for three or six months till he gets his, uh, he's building a house at the moment and he uh, needs to finish that? can't uh, take six months off. Yeah, ideally you want to get to this within three months of the initial injury, ideally even, hopefully even sooner. The issues you have, there's a couple, which I'll show, I haven't, I haven't, you've got to use the microphone. Oh, sorry, which I'll talk about in uh, my presentation a bit later, but the, the biggest risk of develop, development of fatty atrophy of the uh, rotator cuff muscle, and once that's developed it's irreversible and will have a significant effect on the success of any surgery and the outcome of uh, his function. Um, so it needs to be on quickly. I, I agree there's no indication for non-operative management in this person. They've got a 50% uh, chance of tear progression within five years and a 75% chance of developing a rotator cuff arthropathy later in life. So even if he becomes clinically asymptomatic, it would still be best treated uh, with a rotator cuff repair in this age group in this scenario. Okay, so just to be clear, um, we would certainly recommend surgery, not today or tomorrow, but sooner rather than later, and there are a number of reasons for that. When the cuff tears, you get bleeding, and there's an inflammatory response, and within that inflammatory response are healing cells that come to the rotator cuff. And I would actually counsel the patient to try and have the surgery within a couple of weeks of the injury, because it has been clearly shown that the cytokines and growth factors that come with the inflammatory process have a beneficial effect on healing of the rotator cuff. Furthermore, as John mentioned, it is if you are considering surgery, 
it would be contraindicated to try to give them a subacromial cortisone injection even to reduce their pain. And the reason for that is the cortisone injection will turn off the healing response of the rotator cuff for about 12 weeks. It will soften the edge of the rotator cuff and potentially allow the tear to get a little bit bigger. So, Duron, the final question is, what operation would you do in this 45-year-old man with, a say, a one and a half to two centimetre tear of supraspinatus and a ruptured long head of biceps? Would you, or what type of surgery would you do? Would you repair the biceps and do a tenodesis? Uh, so I would uh, definitely do an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. I wouldn't do this open. Uh, a lot depends on, if the, if the biceps is already ruptured, I wouldn't go and chase it and try and bring it back up because I think that can create a lot of pain. I think a biceps tenodesis with an intact biceps is a good pain relieving operation. Uh, whether you do single row or double row depends a lot on the quality of the tendon. And these days we're also thinking more towards doing something called a superior capsular reconstruction where we're putting some tissue in between the glenoid and the humeral head if the person's got particularly poor quality uh, rotator cuff. And, and that, that, you know, the early results of that are very promising. But it's, it's another one of these operations that you really got to watch the space because the early results are, are, are promising, but there's nothing like follow-up to mess up your results. Okay, just, um, you're going to hear a lot more about this procedure called a superior capsular reconstruction. And what it involves is taking um, an artificially produced ligament, usually made of skin, cadaver skin, or taking the fascia lata uh, allograft or a tendo Achilles allograft and place and uh, attaching it to the top of the glenoid and the tuberosity. And what that supposedly does is it holds the humeral head down and then you repair the rotator cuff on top of that. And the early results, and as Duron mentioned, they are very early, um, but they are encouraging in that they protect the cuff repair and the outcomes are thought to be a lot better. Uh, we have no long-term data, but people are starting to do this all over the world. It was invented by a Japanese surgeon originally called Mahata, and I think that's one of the uh, places we're heading. The other place we're heading for the future of cuff repair is using growth factors using amnion which uh, has growth factors so we get the amnion from uh, after a caesarean section and we attach it to the top of the shoulder around the rotator cuff and growth factors from the amnion leach into the cuff and improve not only tendon to bone healing but thicken the cuff um, and it's in a way a type of stem cell uh, treatment. So they're the two areas uh, that we're looking at improving the results of cuff repair. So we might leave it at that and I'll get Ivan to discuss two cases.